Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. So what have we learned so far? In this, the 100th and 101st episode of the IoT Business Show, I look back and give you my unfiltered take on the last 60 episodes. I'll cover what I learned, how it fits into the big picture, and who would benefit from listening to the episode again or for the first time. Think of it as a cliff notes or a Reader's Digest summary of the last 60 hours of interview goodness in under two hours. The signal to noise ratio is quite high, so take a listen. It'll be worth your time. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is for business leaders and managers employing the Internet of Things for their business or the business of their customers. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair, and I interview the industry's leading authorities to find out how they use IoT to improve business and create value. If you like this show, subscribe to it on iTunes and go to iotinc.com to check out my complimentary articles, videos, meetups, and webinars. If you're a longtime fan of the show, you're going to love this episode and the next. Background stories, summaries of important concepts, how they fit into the big picture, what's not to like? Next up will be a mini-series on AI in IoT. I'm lining up the guests now. And on a final note, if you want to take your learning to the next level, consider becoming a certified IoT professional by checking out my ICIP online training program at www.iot-inc.com slash training. If you've listened to any of the rerun episodes, you've heard all about it. Difference now is that it is publicly available. Again, for more information, that's www dot iot dash inc dot com. Okay, on with the retrospective. We start off with episode number 42, Legal by Design, Being IoT Lawful from the Start, where I interview Mark Radcliffe of DLA Piper. Mark is an IoT lawyer, among other things, and we start talking about the concept of risk management. This was the first time that it really started teasing apart the concept or the business concept of risk versus the technical concept of cybersecurity for me. And it also illuminated the fact that there are many forms of risk, not just privacy, which is what we often hear about. And in fact, we go through the risk framework or the risk liability matrix when we go through the different forms of risk. If you are someone that needs to understand the legal implications of your product system or environment or that of your customers, this episode is a good place to start. Again, episode 42. Episode 43 is called The Existential Risk to the Mobile Industry in IoT. This was a solo podcast with just me, and it was talking about the fast rising or the fast rising tide of LPWA, and that's low-powered wide area networks. Until then, and and this is only going back um, about a year, a little bit more than a year, until then, we were using cellular modems, I suppose, for these long-range connections. Now, the risk here wasn't as much in technology, but it was more regarding the business model. Technology now, if we fast-forward I don't know, a year or 18 months, we now have IOTNB and we have CAT1 and CAT2 and a few others that I forget. So the technology for LPWA is starting to be folded into the mobile networks. That's still not the problem. The problems still are the business models. Now, the business models of 
the operators are evolving, but they need to evolve to go from the relatively few users to high bandwidth to relatively a high number of users, that being devices, to low bandwidth. So this episode makes a lot of sense if you are looking at an LPWA or low-powered wide area network um, network, and you want to understand the differences, at least with the business models, between the newcomers, such as Laura and Sigfox, and the existing mobile options that you have with cellular. Episode 44 is called IoT Regulations and the Information Security Program. And this with John Ashback of GDT. GDT um, actually was a client of mine. They are a system integrator based out of Texas. In episode 44, we talk about what I my take, my biggest take out of this episode was the need for a security handbook or an information security program. And as part of the information security program, there's a handbook. And this handbook tells you what to do when risks actually occur. So we talked about the legal, the legalities of risk uh, two episodes before this. And now we talk about some practical advice or we give you some practical advice on what to do before a breach occurs. Now, a breach may never occur depending on the type of target you are, but it likely will. And so instead of scrambling at the time, this episode with John gives some very good advice on what you should do to prepare for this eventuality in advance so that when it happens, you're in a lot better shape. Episode 45 was called What's New? Slashing Forecast, the Digit Bill and MQTT ISO Standard. And it was with me again as a solo. I think I might have done one more of these, but these were kind of a flop or this one was kind of a flop. I was really just looking at the current issues of the day and giving my perspective on them. In this case, the slashing forecast was in particular for Nokia. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think they slashed 20, maybe 20 billion devices off of their forecast, something like that. And uh, the MQTT, MQTT is a application protocol and it was uh, standardized by the ISO standard body. So, yeah, maybe not. Maybe skip this episode. However, uh, if you're into MQTT and you just want to get a little bit more detail, the information's kind of stale now. So I think I would just say skip this episode. Episode 46 is called the IoT Playbook. Schneider Electric is all in. This was with Prith Banerjee when he was with Schneider Electric. I met Prith actually when he was with Accenture. And we kept in contact. And then he was actually recruited to be the CTO of Schneider Electric, Schneider Electric being a very large organization. Uh, Prith has now moved on, but the advice that he gives is excellent. And really, it's kind of like a playbook for a large organization. Now, I've uh, consulted for large organizations, small, tiny, tiny organizations, and everywhere in between. And really, when you start talking about uh, large companies that have very large number of products, this episode is for you. And in particular, it's a step-by-step methodology that Prith used, who is one of the foremost experts in IoT. In fact, he actually wrote uh, one of the prefaces for my book. In any case, this episode is really worth uh, your listen if you are in a large company or you sell to large companies and you want to get a playbook for um, how Prith approached the, I'm not going to call digitization of the products, but maybe that's a good way of looking at it because that really was the first step and that was connecting everything. But there's a whole methodology for how you should go about connecting everything. My view, of course, is that before you connect everything, you need to have a plan and particularly you need to have a data science plan and you need to have a plan that dictates how you're creating value by connecting everything. But we get into it with Prith. And this is uh, definitely a a gem of an episode. Episode 47 is called IoT Ecosystems, the business counterpart to platforms. This is an important episode, at least in my mind, because it started clarifying the difference between a ecosystem and a platform. So an IoT platform is the technical underpinning to deliver outcomes. And the ecosystem, let's call it the business underpinning for delivering outcomes. And as part of the ecosystem, we get into business models and how you compensate more than one company within an ecosystem. 
Ecosystems are the big play, and they're why we're seeing such a big fight right now in the home automation market or the smart home market, because everyone is trying to establish the ecosystem. Ecosystems are evolving in different ways, in different industries. That's in the consumer industry, an IoT consumer, but it evolves differently in the IoT uh, commercial industry, IoT industrial IoT, and infrastructure IoT. So this is a short episode. It's worth it um, if you're starting to look at ecosystems and want to tease apart maybe some of the important points and specifically understand their differences and some key, I guess, advice on if you're joining an ecosystem, what you should be doing. Episode 48 is called SME All-Star, How to Develop an IoT Business Around Data. And it's with Christian Schaefer of All Traffic Solutions. This is a great episode, and it's a use case actually for what they call traffic calming devices. You've seen them. A speed bump is an example, but another more IoT-oriented example that, that Christian gets into are those signs that you see on the side of the road that display the speed limit and display your speed that you're taking. And they're very effective. And Christian's company um, that he works for, All Traffic Solutions, created an IoT version. And he goes through the business models. He goes through costs. um, He goes through the issue. And this is one of the first times when we got into it in the the podcast, but the issues of going to a service-based business model. There are issues and you need to think about these issues. So this is a great episode to listen to. I actually use an example uh, from uh, Christian in my book, IoT Inc., and uh, he has a book too, and I link to it on Amazon, a self-published book that he goes through. He goes through the steps that they took as a company. So that's in the show notes. So go to episode 48. If you want to have a good example from a small or medium-sized enterprise that has developed what I consider a very robust IoT program. Episode 49 is called Data Analytics Step 2 in IoT Deployments, and that's okay. This is with me. It's another solo episode. And the main point here has been coming from my experience at that time, and still now, it still is valid, that of how to sell IoT solutions. And the main premise um, is that IoT solutions provide a lot of value and a lot of different forms of value. However, the types of value that are most sellable today and back then are still IT kind of centric value generators. Those are in the areas of asset utilization, of which predictive maintenance is one of them, and operational efficiency. So listen to this episode. It's it's a good one because it comes directly from my experience in working with my clients in selling IoT solutions. And I introduced the concept of a thin edge of the wedge. And that is to start with something simple, start with something that can be understood. You don't want their eyes kind of rolling back or glazing over when you're telling them what you can do with IoT. So in other words, hold back a little bit, but at the same time, get the permission to gather data and gather data to the point where you can then start offering them a data a data, uh, or a service, a data service based product. This is one of the business models, one of the five main business models that I talk about in my book, I talk about in my program, and that is the product service base, uh, product service business model. That is a product with an information service that goes with it. In any case, listen to this episode uh, specifically if you're selling IoT solutions and just get some, I don't know, some, some advice from someone that has a lot of arrows in their back from going on a lot of sales calls and meeting with a lot of people with my clients and trying to sell them IoT uh, solutions. I've learned a lot. Episode 50 is called Bright Eyes. There's an IoT fog along the horizon. So this is with Helder, uh, Antunes, Jeff Fetters, and Lynn Car- uh, Canavan. And from the, it's an interview with the folks from the Open Fog Consortium. So fog computing, uh, great. Um, there's a place for it. But you need to think about fog computing. And so just to define it, the fog is the computing surface between the cloud and the device. That's how I define it. And there's different definitions that take the fog all the way up into the cloud and that actually take it on the device. Well, I call that cloud computing. And, I, and I'm kind of liking this term of miscomputing and that being computing that's happening within the embedded device. 
Anyway, fog is the computing that occurs on the IT and OT networks. And, you know, sometimes people are saying the, the edge, um, and, and people refer to fog as the edge, even though technically the edge is really the IoT device. So that is an embedded system, the computing on the embedded system. But nonetheless, people are looking at fog as being the next big thing and where you should be doing all your computing. That's wrong. You should be looking at fog again as one option of computing surface. And you're going to want to balance those. You're going to want to balance your computing as well as your storage and your networking um, between the embedded system that is really the thing or that's in the thing, the fog and the cloud. So this episode is great uh, because it introduces you to the Open Fog Consortium. And if you're working in that area, it's worth a listen. Episode 51 is called IoT Standards. What do you mean? And it's another solo episode with me, and I go through IoT standards. Now, this is really important because a lot of people conflate IoT standards to being one standard. And in fact, there are three different categories of standard. There are There is the media layer, and that is kind of more or less the radio, but it can also be Ethernet, so it could be wired. There is the network standard, and standard layer um, protocol They're all more or less uh, synonymous. And in this episode, I tease apart the three and sort of make that point that there are really three standards. Furthermore, I make the point that there is a fourth standard that's kind of a meta standard. So the application protocol gives you information on, so it's metadata, so it's data on the data. And um, that, that data though, if you want to put into a bigger context, such as, for, for example, if you have a smart car, you can have an application protocol. Then you have a smart city, uh, you're going to have an application protocol, but for the smart car to work within the smart city, and of course, this is just one example, and this is applicable to many others, then you need to have a fourth level protocol. These are occurring in different industries, and I do talk about that. But listen to this episode. It's for you if you want to understand, and it's pretty short. But episode 51, if you want to understand the protocols in IoT and what can be standardized and what can't be standardized. What definitely can be standardized is the network protocol. Right now, we've got two networks, as we talked about in the fog layer. We've got the OT networks and we have the IT networks. IT networks, they're all standardized. They're standardized on IP protocol, whether that's IP version 4 or IP version 6, which is close to my heart because that was the last business I was in. That area for both OT and IT can be standardized. However, standardizing on radios doesn't make sense because each radio type or media layer or media protocol has its strengths and weaknesses. Similarly, application protocols are often industry specific. And so it's going to be very difficult to standardize there. We may not have that many different standards, but there'll be more than one. However, on the network side, the network protocol, the network layer, the network standard, all being the same thing, this is an area to standardize on. And so I kind of lead the charge on what to do to make sure that you are planning properly. Because you want to, if you are doing a a greenfield uh, deployment, then you want to make sure that the standards are IT if possible. And if they're not, then you want to talk to your vendors about it. Episode 52 is called the Accelerator as the first Internet of Things ecosystem. So an ecosystem brings together the producers and the consumers of of IoT technology in order to monetize it. And so an accelerator, and there are many different accelerators for young IoT companies, in a way you can think about it as as the first ecosystem, although you're not necessarily selling. So maybe it's not a good example. In any case, we're talking to Tech Riot. I, I speak with Tech Riot, uh, Vic, Susie, Jake, and Matthew from Tech Riot, who are in Colorado and have one such incubator. And I um, can't remember how I initially came in contact with these uh, with these folks, but in any case, it's a good listen. Uh, if you are a small company thinking about joining an accelerator, I would listen to it. If you're a big company thinking about starting an accelerator, I would listen to it. Episode 53, entitled My Opening Keynote at Internet of Things World 2016. Well, later on, I also have my opening keynote from Internet of Things World 2017. 
this is the first time I did it. It's a very big audience. Um, this is a 12,000, 14,000 person conference, over a thousand people in the audience. It was by far the largest uh, public, I guess, presentation I've done uh, to date. Uh, actually, the one in 2017, so just less than a year ago, was a little bit larger than that. But this is a fun episode because I kind of mic'd myself a little bit before um, my presentation just to hear kind of uh, what I go through, practicing lines, talking to people behind stage. And then the presentation itself is of value. Now, note, and I've learned my lesson here because I kept trying to make this joke work, but I have a joke in one of the first, I don't know, first couple minutes of my presentation that totally flopped. And it's about one of my first clients and the mouse and how they get caught and oh, it just it just totally flopped and I tried it so many times and this is something I've learned as a public speaker since then I've I've done many different keynotes uh, you know all over the place and uh, you can't force a joke if it doesn't work it doesn't work and I've noticed the ones that work and sometimes they're the ones you don't expect it expect to work and so you just keep using those in any case um, this is a good presentation. I think it's about 40 minutes in in uh, in uh, length and um it's a good it's a good overview on IoT. So, take a listen to it. It's a, it's a it's a oh, it's good. It's good. It's worth your time. Episode 54. New business models and consumer IoT are still solidifying. This is with Nate Williams. Uh he's the chief revenue officer from August Home. August Home are a connected lock maker if you're not familiar with the company. Now, this is interesting. This is worth a listen if you are going to be going in the consumer IoT market. Very relevant today. We have a challenge in the consumer IoT market because in the B2B IoT market, which covers industrial IoT, commercial IoT, and infrastructure IoT, we've got a lot more leeway with the types of business models we can use. And ultimately, what we're trying to do over time is match that of the customer's business model. However, when we're talking about consumers, we have a different challenge because a consumer household isn't necessarily run on a P&L. Yeah, everyone has a budget or most people have a budget, but making buying decisions aren't going to be based on on the home's P&L. Now, the issue is, and this gets in, uh, I don't get into it in this, but the cost for an IoT product, for an IoT consumer product, is much more expensive than its traditional counterpart. And so if you sell it as a product business model, it's going to be real challenging because generally in the consumer space, a connected or a smart product will be around 10 times. Look at a lock. It's that, you know, a $15 deadbolt versus $150 or $200 um, connected deadbolt. It'll be 10 times. And so what we're talked, what I talked about, uh, with Nate was kind of going through there, kind of grilling them a little bit on this. They're still venture funded, but this is really important for anyone, um, that's moving into consumer in the consumer space to just think about different ways of augmenting the business model when selling an IOT product to the, well, to consumers. Episode 55 is called data or dollars. Who's going to pay for consumer IoT? So this is kind of a episode 55. It's kind of a follow on. And I guess it's my thoughts. Um, and I never really did this again. This is something, this is another experiment I was thinking about doing and kind of having a, uh, I guess, an analysis episode after, after I, don't, I won't say all episodes, but after a lot of episodes. But I didn't, I didn't continue doing it. But in any case, I get into this 10x problem. I get into, and as the... As the title suggests, one methodology is data. So selling data to augment the cost of um, IoT products, whether they're connected products, smart products, um, or true IoT products. And that's for other episodes. But in any case, this is worth a listen, again, if you are going to be selling in the consumer IoT space or want to know about the consumer IoT space and talking about data. Now, right away, when you start talking about data, then you get into privacy issues, specifically with consumer IoT. Privacy is all being driven by the government because when you buy a connected lock, for example, you're not bringing your lawyer with you. You're not having your lawyer look at the terms and conditions of the contract so that you have to sign before you connect up these products. And that's why governments are the advocates of consumers. 
But in any case, privacy is an issue. We tease it apart or I tease it apart in this episode. So if you're interested in consumer IoT and privacy in general, this is probably a good episode for you. Episode 56 is called IoT Security Assessment. Black hat, white hat, or gray? And this with Paul Jugger Gooey. I know I butchered his name. Sorry, Paul, if you're listening. Paul's actually become a friend over the, over the years. Well, it hasn't been years, I suppose. But he actually approached me at IoT World, that same IoT World where I was just talking about the keynote presentation. And we got to talking and, yeah, very thoughtful guy. And um, while he runs the marketing for a Praetorian, which is a security company, he, he knows his stuff. And so there we cover a lot of different issues with regard to security, with respect to security and IoT. And I would say that we also, one takeaway, and if you're looking at to a reason to listen to this episode, number 56, it goes through black hat pen testing. So pen testing is short for penetration testing versus white hat pen testing and gray hat pen testing. And so Paul gives some good advice to anyone who is considering hiring an external security firm. This is something I recommend. This is something I've done with my clients because often you don't have the necessary security talent in-house. And for the cost of hiring one of these organizations, the return on investment is quite high. So if you're interested in security, interested in pen testing, interested in perhaps hiring a external security house um, as a partner, then this episode is, is a good one for you. Episode 57 is called Driverless Cars, How IoT Cars Work and Why They're Coming Fast. This is a solo episode with me, and I talk about, I guess, the technology of IoT cars and how it can be mapped into an IoT product, obviously a discrete product, and then I map it to my methodology. And for those that are not aware of my methodology, I like to break IoT technology, not as a networking stack, because that's not where the value is. But when looking at value, I like breaking into four parts. And the first part being the virtual, the virtualization of the physical. This is a software defined product and of which a part, part of it is the digital twin. And as you'll see um, later on, I get into digital twin quite a bit uh, with different, with different episodes. But in any case, uh, this is a good episode. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it just maps, like I said, IOT into driverless cars, how, why they're IOT vehicles, how you generate value with IOT, with, with IOT cars or driverless cars and kind of the different methodologies for building up driving models. So I get a little bit into analytics and the two different approaches with respect to, I think it's called Waymo now. So Google's um, driving uh, approach or approach to developing a, a driving model. So analytical and cognitive, and then looking and contrasting it with Tesla's. And they have two different methodologies for how they've been developing their driverless models. So a digital twin consists of a federation of original data and models. Those models are generally analytical, but they're often and becoming more and more cognitive. So that being generated with AI and the type of AI is generally deep learning. So you'll enjoy this episode if you want to get a little bit into that, understand these models a little bit more, but it's kind of a lightweight episode. Episode 58 is called Horizontal IoT Data and the Internet of Things Platform. It's with Nigel Upton of HP Enterprise. This is a good episode. We, In the first 40 episodes that I've done another retrospective on, uh, episode 40 and 41, um, we talk about I talk about, to a number of different people, IoT platforms. Very important. Uh, everyone needs one. No one should build it themselves. However, not necessarily strategic. But that's for another that's for another episode description. This episode is good to start thinking about meta platforms. So to deliver outcomes, let's step back. An IoT platform is to bring together the different components of an IoT product. That product can be a system. It could be a discrete product. It can be a system or it can be an environment. Well, that is that makes a lot of sense. But when you evolve IoT technology, uh, what's going to happen is we want to then bring together different products, or let's say the same products from the same product line, and then eventually different products from different product lines to work together. 
This is also done with the IoT platform. It can be done in a couple different ways. You can have a platform of platforms, or you can have a single platform that handles the multiple products. And again, the idea here is to orchestrate those multiple products to work together to deliver an outcome. So episode 58 introduces a concept of a horizontal data platform using HP as an example. It's not sales oriented. None of my podcasts are. Um, they're all about teaching, not preaching. Uh, but uh, but Nigel does a great job and we go through a number of scenarios. And one of them being the one actually I brought up a little bit earlier with respect to how do you have a driverless car within a smart city and getting into metadata and being able to to bring data across and the issues. And that's why the name is called Horizontal IoT Data is the issues associated with moving data between, I guess we'll call them different products. And again, when I say product, I mean a discrete product, a system, or an environment. Episode number 59 is called Smart Homes, the IoT ethos of the Jetsons. This is a solo episode, and it's a little bit of a lightweight episode, um, but I do talk about smart homes. This, um, this is an area that I started in when I was the CEO of a company called GoGo6, and we sold a platform really as a way to provide an ROI for our IPv6 solution, but we sold it to ISPs to deliver or to enable smart home services. And in particular, and it's still today, when we're dealing with private networks, and those are networks that share an IP address, and that's happening less and less as IPv6 gets introduced, but um, there, are, there are issues that you need to solve. And one of the I guess the easiest way to solve the issue of being able to address multiple objects uh, within a private network is using IPv6 and doing a proxy for IPv4 and going back and forth. In any case, that was my experience in the smart home business. So I suppose that's really where my, not I suppose, that is where my Internet of Things experience started. That was like nine years ago, almost 10 years ago. Um, in this episode, however, I speak to the issue of DIY, so do it yourself, and whether or not we're really there. So if you're interested in smart homes, this is worth it. Like I said, it's a little bit of a lightweight episode, but it's fun and short. Episode 60 is called Raising the IQ of San Francisco with Pervasive Smart City Networks. It's with McGill Gamino, and at the time he was, I can't remember the exact his exact title, I guess it was CIO uh, for San Francisco. He has since moved on to being the CTO of New York City. So a great move for Miguel or Miguel. And actually, I just saw on LinkedIn today, I saw a post that he left, um, but is now going back to the private sector with kind of a public sector uh, viewpoint. So I met Miguel actually at that same conference, Internet of Things World 2017. He actually came on stage after me. We got to know each other, and I interviewed him on what he was doing in San Francisco. So, actually, McGill also wrote a preface or a wrote an endorsement that was that was also printed in my book IoT Inc. So, this is a great episode if you are into smart cities, obviously, infrastructure IoT, and just some of the. I guess sometimes sometimes I'm guilty of this, but I'm thinking a little bit too complicated. And this goes back to the sales process. So I'm guilty of it, but I know it and I, and I correct for it. Well, a lot of people think a little bit too grandiose, let's say, uh, initially. So McGill actually gives a different perspective and really talks about some low-hanging fruit or some very simple things that you can do with IoT that make a big difference to the citizens of a city. So uh, take a listen. It's uh, worth your time. Episode 61 is called Kissing Dumb Smart Products and Kissing is the acronym, or KISS is the acronym of uh, Keep It Simple Stupid. And, uh, there's, uh, my father used to call it that way. I think there's a there's probably a more politically correct or nicer way of saying it. Being Canadian, I'm always thri- being Canadian, I'm always thriving for the nicer way of saying it. But in any case, the issue, or this episode, is a solo episode with me. Uh, another lightweight episode, so listen to it if you're in, if you are in consumer IoT, and just give you my pers- and it gives you my perspective on consumer IoT products. And um, I've seen a lot of them in my day. I've worked with a few consumer products, although most of my experience is more in B two B IoT. But what I talk about in this case is the principle of keeping it simple is not really happening in the 
IoT consumer space. And generally, we're heaping on a lot of extra bells and whistles that provide very little incremental value. Now, you have to remember, it's a pretty simple formula, but the incremental value has to be greater than the incremental cost for an IoT product, whether that's in B2B or B2C. As I spoke about earlier in this podcast, with B2B, you have a little bit more flexibility because you work with business models. In B2C, you're a little bit more constrained there. So fundraising, or I should say crowdsourced, crowdsourced fundraising, is to a certain extent at fault for all the IoT consumer products that are out there. And I think maybe I talk about my top 10 dumb IoT products, I think, although I generally don't take a negative view in this podcast. But if you're working in consumer IoT, it's a short episode, and episode 61 is worth your time. Episode 62 is called Privacy by Design in the Internet of Things. It's with Paul Profchan, and he used to be with ADT. He has now moved on to ADT, but Paul and I have uh, kept in touch. Mostly we see each other at the different conferences, Although I haven't been going to as many, I'm just kind of reflecting on that lately. I haven't been going to as many conferences lately. And my wife actually was saying, don't you need to keep your visibility up? And I said, well, I got the book, I got the program. But yeah, I probably need to start hitting the road and going back and starting to hit the conference circuit a little bit more than I do. In any case, this in this episode, ADT being a security company, being a consumer consu- uh, uh, security company, we deal with the issue of privacy. And if you remember, privacy is just one form of risk. And we talk about what what are the steps that ADT is taking and how you can apply those to your own business. So this is really a good episode. It's one of um, it's one of a number of privacy episodes. And if you want to get any particular topic, there's a couple ways of doing it. If you do go to www-iot-inc.com. There's a search function that works very well. And then also if you click what I call the hamburger, I'm not sure what it's called, but the three lines, then you can look in all the podcasts and the videos and the articles are all classified. And privacy is one of those classifications. But in any case, episode 62 is about privacy, consumer IoT. And so if that fits... uh, that fits what you're doing, it's definitely worth your time. I'm saying it's worth your time for all these podcasts, but I guess I'm biased, obviously. So really, if this is something that you're interested in, it's worth your time. If you're not interested in this area, eh, it might be informational, but it may not be worth your time. Episode 63 is called IoT Security, the Security Development Lifecycle Way. This was Chris Romeo of Security Journey. This is on, this is more technology oriented, but it's technology oriented for managers. And in fact, this podcast was pretty influential, uh, that with some discussions um, with with some uh, security folks that I know on how I structured my chapter in IoT Inc. And I was really kind of fumbling there until I kind of came across, yeah, it just came across the idea. It was actually one of my book reviewers that made the suggestion, Paul from Praetorium, who said, why don't you use the security development life cycle as a way of structuring your chapter? And in fact, that's what I did. And it really improved the chapter in the book. And just as a side note, how many did I have? I had 48. I had 48 peer reviewers uh, for my book. I had, what was it? Three per chapter, I think is what it worked out to. And there's 16 chapters. And so Paul was one of the reviewers for the security uh, for the security chapter. But that's an aside. And the security development lifecycle is a, I think Microsoft was probably the first to, I guess, publicize it. I could be wrong, but I think Microsoft was. It's used mostly in, and originally it was used for IT security, but it's very applicable to IoT security. Now, something you hear a lot is security by design. And that makes sense, but design, the whole idea behind the security development life cycle is that each step in the life cycle of developing a product, system, or environment requires you to look at security in different ways. Design is really only one of those steps. So when you hear security by design, it's true, but really it's a subset of the security development life cycle. This is a good episode If you want to understand security or cybersecurity and IoT a little bit better, 
I would listen to episode 63. Episode 64 is called IIoT Manufacturing, From Shop Floor to the Top Floor. So the idea from the factory floor up to management. It's with Tanya Ruckert from SAP. She's their senior VP of IoT. So I met her also. She spoke at that same conference. So it seems like uh, that conference was pretty instrumental, at least for guests uh, for my podcast. But Tanya and I got along great. Um, she's she's funny. She's nice. And, and we kept in touch afterward. She actually also was uh, one of the people that wrote a preface of I don't know what they're called uh, at the beginning of the book, but she's uh, she's published in my book, said some very nice things about the book. But this episode gets into process, not process, but it's more discrete manufacturing than process manufacturing. There's another episode where I get into process manufacturing with Emerson, um, the company Emerson. But this episode was very interesting because it's looking at the factory as a product and looking at applying IoT to the factory to build IoT products. And what I liked about this episode was just broadening the thinking, which which makes a lot of sense. And then this concept of mass produced customized products. And this apparently is a big trend in IIoT or Industry 4.0 if you're in Europe. Um, and we talk about it at length. So Tanya is a big swinger. She's got a great view on IoT, you know, from that, well, from that top floor point of view. So I recommend this this episode specifically if you're in manufacturing or moving into manufacturing with IoT. Episode 65 is called Open Source IoT Platforms. Ready for prime time? It's with Hans uh, Scharler from ThingSpeak. And the idea behind this episode was for me to investigate open source IoT platforms. There's a lot of benefits to using an IoT platform, and I talk about them extensively in this podcast, the book, and the the online training program. Um, But there's there's also some downsides, and in particular, the downside is with respect to the risk of building on rented land. Now, I advocate building on rented land, so I also talk about more in the book and in the program, I guess, than in this episode on what to do when when buying a platform to to mitigate risk or to minimize risk. And those risks are the company can just change their mind, get out of the business, they can go bankrupt. And so there's certainly techniques that you uh, should follow, or I guess best practices that you should follow when... Uh, buying an IoT platform, leasing an IoT platform, renting an IoT platform, however you're doing it. Don't build an IoT platform. That's still my recommendation. That's not what this episode's about. This episode was me investigating whether open source IoT platforms are ready yet. And they mitigate or they eliminate a lot of the risks when you um, sign up for a commercial IoT platform. At the end of the day, Hans and I kind of came to the conclusion that at least now, and now still being now, being 2017, 2018, uh, my conclusion was, maybe Hans, it wasn't Hans' conclusion, but my conclusion was that they're just not ready for prime time yet. And keep an eye on them. I believe like middleware in all other industries, a big it can be commoditized. And it's not going to be stuff in the middle. It's going to be the networking a component of the middleware that's going to be commoditized, not the data gathering on one side and not the data analytics on the other side. But like in other industries, a middleware will be commoditized and eventually IoT platforms will be able to be deployed at scale. And that's the biggest issue is being able to deploy. Yeah, it's one thing to deploy 100,000. I'll say that. When you start getting to 10,000, 100,000 and a million, you really need a platform that scales. And as of, you know, as of right now, um, the, I guess the summary is that open source platforms are not there yet. However, if you want to understand the issues with open source platforms, understand how they're different, how they work, I definitely recommend listening to this episode. Episode 66 is called IoT Retail Tech, Converging Offline, Online Shopping. And this is with Uleg Puzanov, and he's from Lenit. Let me get this right, Lean Tegra. Now, I get a lot 
of incoming, I guess, asks or requests from PR people. And I generally don't take them because I have a editorial calendar and I have a plan for this podcast. And I try to take you, my listener, through a certain path. However, there are cases where if the timing is right, or if it's very interesting to me and I'm kind of in between um, kind of major thrusts on the podcast, I will I will, uh, will actually entertain uh, PR people's requests for interviews and actually sometimes do them. So PR, PR is not dead, although it doesn't really work very much with me, again, because I have a plan. However, every once in a while it does. This is an example where I was very interested in retail IoT and specifically how to blend online retail or on or I should say e-commerce with commerce. I have another video on the website too that gets into this issue. Again, if you're interested in retail, just go to www.iot-inc.com and do a search for retail or, or press on that hamburger I was talking about earlier. Ulag and I get into how IoT is being used both within the store and the shopping mall and how it's enhancing the experience and specifically looking at, again, the offline and online convergence that's happening in retail. So I don't know about you, but I've done it. You've probably done it too. You go into a big box store, you see the price of the product. Or you see the product, first of all, you look at reviews online, then you look at the price, make sure you're getting a good deal. Well, that's an issue, obviously, for bricks and mortar. And large chains are, are large bricks and mortar uh, retail chains are closing all the time. Um, and so there has to be something, I believe, that needs to blend together the online experience with the in-presence experience. Because often you do want to see the product and not just buy it online. So that's what this episode's about. If that interests you, then listen to episode 66. Episode 67 is called Opening Soon, Commercial Data Marketplaces for IoT. And in that episode, I speak with David Knight of Turbine. Turbine spelled T-E-R-B-I-N-E. David is an interesting person. I like him. We've kept in touch. And the concept here is buying data sources. So all incremental value of an IoT product comes from transforming data into useful information. And only part of that data is being gathered by sensors. If we develop an IoT product, and actually I kind of didn't go through the four components I was talking about it before, but the center is the virtualization, the software-defined product, then the way I view IoT product system environments is then you have the the hardware-defined product, which is your sensors, embedded system, actuators, You have your external systems, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. And then you have a network fabric that connects everything together. That's how I see the four parts. In this episode, we're talking about external data sources. So kind of use the term, the cliche, maybe data is a new oil. Well, in this case, there's a lot of challenges, but a lot of value in being able to connect to external data sources, whether that's for commodity pricing, weather, Uh, There's many, many example of microservices that are available today that you can actually click to and use the data within your product. And Turbine is one of a number of different marketplaces, let's call them marketplaces for IoT data. So it's very interesting. And I think it's applicable pretty much to everybody. And this is, um, yeah, this is one of, this is one of the most talked about uh, podcasts, I would say, um, that I've done in a long time. So it's episode 67 on uh, commercial data places for IoT data. Episode 68 is called Product Management for the Internet of Things. It's with Daniel Alizalde. I think that's how you pronounce it. And he's from techproductmanagement.com. So in this episode, we talk about Daniel's... um, Daniel teaches a continuing education course at Stanford, and he's developed what he calls the IoT Decision Framework. And this is, again, specifically for IoT product managers, and it lets you look at all the different uh, aspects of, it forces you to look at the different aspects of what you need to consider when developing an IoT product system or environment. So if you're a product manager interested in product management, uh, take a listen to episode 68. Episode 69 is another keynote. It's actually from IoT Tech Expo in 2016. 
So, but I guess uh, by the time this episode comes out, then it'll be about a year ago. And this is when I started getting into my whole routine of comparing what I call smart products versus connected products and internet um, IoT products. And I kind of make the case, and it's really a lot of it is for just to make a point because you can't change the use of smart product or connected product for marketing purposes. But I make the point that there's a difference between a smart product, that being a product that has local intelligence, versus a connected product, which is which generally means just having command and control, connecting it to maybe a mobile phone or something like that, to an IoT product and all the different value generators that are possible with an IoT product. So this is a great presentation, in my point, from my point of view, on um, just just looking at an IoT product system or environment from a different perspective, and in particular, looking at the four uh, value creation methods and making sure that you um, think about all of them. So uh, that is episode sixty nine. It's a live recording of the keynote, and it's it's fun, but it's but it's informative. Generally, for these keynotes, a lot of my t- I spend a lot of time on them. They're dense. They have information. Hopefully, they have jokes that don't bomb. Can't remember if I told a bad joke in this one or not. But um, yeah, this uh, this is applicable to pretty much anyone in IoT. If you want to start thinking a little bit differently about your product than just being a connected product, episode seventy is called "Panel: Creating Value from Connected Things." And uh, this was a panel that I moderated for um, the Smart Home Summit in 2016. And it has some pretty, yeah, some pretty uh, pretty good thinkers um, from the VC, Upal Gasu from Nokia Growth Partners, JP Abello, who I worked with actually afterward. Actually, it was another panel, I think, from Nielsen. And uh, we had Gene Han from Target. And um, it's worth a listen in the concept, or the whole concept is around value creation and specifically around consumer IoT or in particular home-based consumer IoT. It's a panel discussion, so it has a lot of different viewpoints. I try to herd the cats and try to really press people on where the value is being created. We talk a little bit about business models and um, yeah, that's episode 70. It's uh, worth listening to if you are in or thinking about consumer IoT, because that's more the focus for this episode. Okay, and that was episode 100. Obviously, an awesome number. If you've been enjoying this podcast, subscribe. That way, you get every episode delivered to your mobile device. And there are three ways you can support this podcast. The first way is you can share it on your blog, either that's your personal blog or your company blog, if you think others will find it valuable. And you can share it on social. Just go to any of the show analysis notes pages. They're all on iotinc.com. And there's a social widget there. And you can leave a rating or review on iTunes. Just go to www iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click and that's for a rating or a little bit longer if you want to leave your thoughts for a review. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next time, may your path to IoT business be a retro one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 